Right. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, just to be clear, if you were looking for a conversation about usability, you're in the wrong place. That's next door. We are talking about openness and learning analytics. Uh, John's role at the Open Learning Initiative is to focus on core software. I need to focus on uh, strategic initiatives and partnerships. And because we think that the analytics space is one where we definitely can't go it alone, we felt like this was a good place for both of us to be talking. Oh, I do, sorry. Uh, before we dive in, one of the things that's been pretty interesting to us about the past day and a half is just how much is going on in the analytics space. So I'm going to give you some warning that uh, we basically rearranged our slide deck over the past half hour to try to capture a lot of the stuff that we've seen happening. Um, and we really feel like, given the people that are in this room, maybe the worst way that we can use this time is for the two of us to stand up here and pontificate. What we'd really like to do is move through the slide deck reasonably quickly and then move on to some discussion it really pushes us forward to talk a little bit about how we as a community can build better analytics tools and build better resources that can plug into those tools. So to talk about where we come from, um, you know, our, our, we take a scientific approach to course design. What that means is we recognize that every course or every learning environment we build is really a hypothesis about what things are going to work. And then we collect data to actually evaluate that experience and drive um, a continuous improvement process. Um, and we do this through uh, communities of use and evaluation. So really, this is really sort of showing what our biases are in the beginning. This scientifically based approach to course development is the water that we swim in, and it has a huge impact on how we perceive the analytics space. Um, obviously, that's not going to be the same way that all of you perceive it, and that's why the conversation becomes interesting. So what would we like to walk out of here with? Um, how many of you read our abstract? Sounded pretty ambitious, right? <laughs> we thought so too after we reread it. So, uh, <laughs> what we'd like to do though is try to deliver a little bit on that promise and dig in a little bit on what some of the tensions are in building uh, reasonable learning analytics, especially around the dimensions of what's happening in use driven design context of OER, how it is that variety and adaptability seem to be creating some conflicts for us in building effective analytics platforms. What tools can we be building? What tools already exist? And uh, what drives it all? How do we get the data? What are the needs and challenges there? From there, let's talk about what a community-based plan for better analytics would look like, and hopefully commit to some action. What are some effective next steps in really building this stuff? There's been a lot of chatter about analytics over the uh, past day and a half. We feel like this is a good opportunity to cement some plans. So um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen our feedback loop slide. Um, the point that we come from is that one of the greatest opportunities of technology-based instruction is this ability to embed assessment throughout the experience and capture data to drive these powerful feedback loops to just better support the learner, to help instructors understand where students are in that learning process and intervene earlier, to better inform the science of learning so that we can refine our approach, um, and to affect um, changes in the course design experience. So there's a really huge, huge opportunity. Uh, in order to do that, to, to realize this, we need assessment and data. And the reason that it's such an opportunity is that the huge amount of OER that are out there and the enormous amount of students that are using it now, not to mention all the potential students that are using it in the future, can be building and creating huge piles of data that can be used to drive these analytic <coughs> systems. Uh, no longer is the information that we're capturing, or no longer does the information that's being generated need to be confined to the individual classroom and confined to simply one faculty member's uh, analysis and interpretation. The size of the data here gives us the opportunity to do things that we think can't happen in context outside of OER. So we think OER, learning analytics, and especially the science of learning, have a potential relationship that couldn't have existed prior to OER's proliferation. So making, but in this space, um, it, it's, it's hard to make sense about data because there's so much variety. And um, uh, Josh took some of the numbers that we uh, we also pulled out, so I won't spend too much time here, but you, know, you look at 19,310 modules and connections. We have uh, something like 2,000 courses in MIT's OpenCourseWare, 2,600 videos in Khan Academy, and all these different things are capturing different types of data in different formats of different systems, or, or maybe they're not collecting data at all. Uh, we have all sorts of spaces, 600 free courses at the EOU, and much, much more out of the OER comments. And so, um, you know, question is, what's driving this? What's driving this? Proliferation. We've done. We've got all these great resources. We we put them out there. We're missing access to them. Um, but why do we have so many statistics courses? Why do we have so many um, mathematics courses? And a huge part of uh, the slide. A huge part of what's driving this comes out of OER's original mission to expand access. Right. Well, 
very early on, the assumption is if we have more stuff out there, then we've expanded access. The more things that are out there, the more students are going to be able to take advantage of it, the more faculty will be able to take advantage of it. But it's, um, it's been expanded, I think, this, this urge towards creating more and more stuff and contributing your stuff has actually also been pushed forward by the philosophy and definition that we have for what constitutes an OER. This need for reuse, redistributing, revising, and remixing the content has led to us putting more and more stuff out into the space. And we'd like to think that it's possible to continue with this philosophy, but avoid the fifth R, which is continuing to recreate things that already exist. Instead, what we'd like to do is continue to think about things in this context, but add this notion of evaluating resources so that we can take what's work, working, continue to build upon it, rather than continuing to recreate the same set of statistics courses, the same modules in biology, and so forth. Yeah, so recreation becomes a barrier to reuse. And if we create opportunities to coalesce and uh, to improve through evaluation, we're actually getting back to our original intent, which is to revise and remix. And this proliferation isn't just happening in the OER space, it's happening in your institutions too. So, you know, it's, it's just happening on a different scale. It's uh, something that happens at Carnegie Mellon is that every department feels like it needs its students to learn how to program. And so they send them off to take an intro to CS course. We go through these cycles where that course will be embedded in the computer science college and all the students will travel there to take their course. And then the departments will decide this isn't meeting their needs and so everyone builds their own intro to programming course. We have one in the business school, one in the IT program, we'll have another course popping up even within the uh, College of Computer Science. This, and and this, is, this is crazy, right? It gets away from the entire notion of what a university ought to be. You know, this notion that we have a center of expertise and uh, that we're going to take advantage of it. But this isn't just at CMU. Everywhere that you go in statistics, folks are feeling like they need to build these specialized statistics courses. Beyond the core statistics that exist in the mathematics and stats department, people feel that they need business statistics, research statistics, uh, statistics for nurses, medical statistics. So this isn't just a problem with the OER, but the low cost of OER, pushing things out into the space for the world to use, actually exacerbates uh, this pre-existing problem, or at least our pre-existing sense of wanting to create an awful lot of stuff. And we, we don't want to, you know, we want to acknowledge that context is important, that proper motivating examples are important in, in these environments and this, across these areas. But there's also uh, a foundational core that comes across all these different times of statistics. And so what we're not talking about is the, the one statistics course. Um, what we're talking about actually engaging across all these different varieties to find commonality. Um, and so just uh, quickly, what's driving change in these settings? Why is it that I want to have uh, 15 different computer science courses or you know, 20 different statistics courses? And it turns out that it's a lot of different things. In some cases, folks are being motivated by data, simply looking at what student performance is happening within their college, within their department. Um, I think market demand tends to be a reasonable driver for folks that are looking at what skills students need to become employable. But let's also acknowledge that there's an awful lot of intuition, I've got a feeling my course isn't working, or simply preference. Uh, I've got an ongoing debate with my college roommate who teaches English uh, at a small liberal arts school out in Pennsylvania, who will call me about once a semester and say, hey, completely changing my intro to film class because I'm bored teaching these films. Well, something about the old films not working? I don't know, I'm just tired of teaching it. Um, so there's a real space in changing things you know, simply based on preference and not based on what we believe does work or what could work better. And that creates all sorts of problems. Um, it means that quality is highly variable, that we're duplicating a lot of effort. Um, it's hard for someone to consume resources if they don't have a basis of choice. They don't know what the pedagogical intent is, what context of use is targeted for, uh, and whether it didn't work at all. And you, when you hit this proliferation, you, I think it's a barrier to adoption if you can't decide on the thing that you actually need. It's hard, because of that, it's hard to evaluate because we're not building pools of data that are deep enough because they're, they're just dis, disfused across a large number of resources. Um, and, and that makes it hard to improve and hard to scale up things that are successful. And all of this is to say, really, that effectiveness is hit or miss. And we're not the only people that are asking this question. If you were at yesterday's keynote, um, that's all right. Sorry, you trade off. I can push the button if you want to stand in front of the podium. <laughs> uh, you heard Dr. Cantor ask exactly the same question. How do we know what's working out there? How do we evaluate this stuff? Uh, so from our perspective at OLI, we would say that an OER is effective if it can demonstrably support students in meeting articulated, measurable learning outcomes in a given set of contexts. Um, we're going to risk throwing off the rest of our presentation right now and ask, is everybody comfortable talking about effectiveness in this way for the rest of the presentation? <laughs>
Did we miss something that you think is important? Wow. Yes. Uh, sorry, I think you had... So uh, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, I think that some of the research that you've done on, on your statistics course that says that, that the students are able to actually achieve the learning outcomes more quickly, especially when we're looking at the challenges around developmental or, or, or general education lower division courses, that the pace at which learning outcomes are achieved is, is the one other piece of that that's, that's critical. So that's what we intended by the given set of context, that we have to acknowledge that context is important when we're measuring effectiveness. So we, have, we agree. Um, could you define measurable learning outcomes for me and um, maybe explicate where qualitative and kind of new pedagogical ways of thinking come in there? But the way that when I, you know, whenever I hear learning analytics or whenever I've seen it, I've seen it in terms of here's multiple choice questions and here's, you know, your way that you're going through the module and it will tell you where you are and where you need to go. Um, but a lot of us that to work in, you know, problem-based education and kind of um, social participation in, you know, diversity of spaces, that doesn't really apply. So I'm wondering if you guys, you know, are thinking about that and what, you know, how your model connects to that. Yeah, absolutely. So, like that. so that's a big question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a big question. So just to spend uh, a few seconds on it. So I can actually give an example of something that we've been, we've been working on. Um, we're, we're working on a number of social learning tools. One of them we're working with is uh, called Knowledge Form. It's a collaboration we're doing with the University of Toronto. Um, and in, in that, it's a, basically a discourse space for uh, folks to engage in knowledge building. So this idea of developing 21st century skills by authentically engaging in discourse around a set of materials. And so we're not doing multiple choice questions, but one of our, we can still have goals for students to come out of that. One of the goals is, in statistics, for example, we want students to, we say, authentically participate in the discourse of the domain. So when they leave the course, they can speak like a statistician. They can understand something in the New York Times. And so how can we assess that? We can look at, uh, we can develop rubrics to measure their engagement in these environments. We can look at their peer interactions. We can look at the growth and spread of ideas in communities. Uh, we, can, we can look for new forms of assessment that go beyond multiple choice questions. So multiple choice questions are one vehicle, but uh, we're actually to this project, the uh, HP Catalyst Initiative, that's looking at this question of new forms of assessments, a global consortium project that we're, we're, involved, we're involved in. Um, so it, it's not that we don't, wanna, we don't want pigeonhole analytics to just uh, tutors and cognitive tutors or questions. There are other ways that we can use data, uh, even in those other contexts. Uh, but and we can talk more. I'm glad to talk more, more with you about it. I would like to hear your perspective in great depth. In this definition, I'm not really sure uh, the phrase demonstrate, demonstrably support students, um, what that means. It seems like that's a little fuzzy. Uh, and I'm not sure how you would actually evaluate that if you're looking at a correlation between student A uh, completed this learning module and did better on this uh, assessment. Is that what you did? So I'm not, that, I'm not real sure. That's, that's pretty fuzzy for me in terms of the definition. Um, so I think that in that context, what we're you know, what that hinges on is this: how it is that we're defining and measuring our learning outcomes. Um, if our learning outcomes are actually measurable, then we are able to see that a student that has taken advantage of or made use of a specific OER has performed better on these outcomes, has achieved the outcome in a better way than so students that hasn't. So when you say taken advantage or made use of, does that mean that they? You know, what does that mean? Is that did they access it? They completed something? They did. I mean, there's a lot of variables within that. And we're, that's we're actually that's, why I'm, that's, why I'm that's great. That sets us up for where we're going with the talk. So if we could hold that question, come back. Let's go back to your question again at the end and see if we've answered it as we get a little further. And so, so if we can move forward with this definition of effectiveness, the question comes up: Is so why aren't we taking a look at this now? Why aren't we hitting on this now? And um, well, it's it, it's hard. It's hard to even define. I mean, this discussion here kind of gets at, at, at some of the some of the challenges there. Um, it's costly. It's not something that an individual faculty member do can do alone. Not simply because the institutions aren't giving them the time to do it, but also because there's a whole range of expertise that's needed around assessment and evaluation and learning science to do this. We we, we don't always have the mechanisms to support them in that way. Um, it can be threatening. I mean, it's we have if we know something doesn't work, we have to do something about it. Um, so that can be threatening. And we have disparate systems, disparate standards, different ways of collecting data. Um, and then you know, this is question of how do we measure effectiveness is, is open. And so the, this all comes down to say is that to make this happen, we need better enabling processes and systems. 
is right. Even when the data is there, to actually drive these feedback loops requires tools for individuals, educators, administrators to be able to look at and actually interpret what's happening in the data. So this is where this continuing demand and need, I think, for learning analytics platforms is coming from. And one of the reasons that this has been uh, what feels like a pretty hot topic of conversation at this conference is people are starting to recognize that. We've got lots of information, but we don't know what to do with it. Yeah, which is, which, uh, is really, you know, just, 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 just what do we do? Okay, we've, we've had a big discussion about the need for learning analytics, but what does it really mean in practice? Like, what, what is learning analytics? And how do we create and use them? Um, and we think that this conversation ends up being difficult to have because often tools that, whether it's us that are building them or other organizations that are building them, end up attempting to build proxies to measure learning rather than uh, attempting to actually authentically engage on the assessment and evaluate whether things are working or not working. And this is natural, right? I mean, a lot of this comes down to what we do in the academy when we give grades. Grades in the end are intended to be a proxy for whether or not a student is achieving their outcomes. Similarly, though, when we're talking about learning analytics, we're also looking at not just the immediate actions of a student against a learning outcome, but how that student's existing in the larger context of a class, how they're existing in the larger context of a university. And so we're using this phrase learning analytics to try to capture lots of different things ranging from this authentic assessment of learning outcomes all the way up into how's this student performing and engaging in my class, how are they existing in their university or college career. And so this kind of comes to um, the definition of work reporting for, for what uh, uh, we consider to be learning analytics. And that's to say that data collection um, isn't really, data isn't really useful as it's used. And that's the sense making of data can actually be a lot harder uh, than necessarily collecting. Sometimes it's easy to collect data, sometimes it's really hard to make sense of it. And so we're defining learning analytics as data reporting, and reporting that allows you to make decisions, intervene, and, and be actionable. And so I give you an example of that. You can, so there's, it's, it's informative to know that there's a correlation between a given set of student behaviors and success. And let's say, let's, say that's, uh, uh, let's say that's logging into the Blackboard or registering for a course or uh, signing up for an OER by a certain date. We've actually, we've actually heard of this before. So that's great. It's really informative so you can predict at-risk students. But how do you intervene? Because that predictive power goes away. If you make the intervention, you make everyone sign up early, um, that prediction power goes away. Or you can look at, uh, we also often get instructors asking us about things like participation data, which again, very useful to know if your students are participating, who's participating, what they're doing, how much, but is making every student do everything really gonna give us a better picture of uh, what, where, where their learning state is? So that's what we're talking about. We wanna make sure that, that we're, we're collecting data that can lead to interventions to improve outcomes. Um, and part of this then ends up trying to ends up being about explicating explicitly what kind of analytic tools we're trying to develop. It's making the distinction between educational and academic management analytics, things that are going to help you predict at-risk students across the whole of your institution, figuring out what kinds of behaviors there are useful in terms of supporting at-risk students. Classroom management analytics, really understanding and predicting across learning outcomes how students are engaging with the material, where they're being successful, but then down in the weeds, how are students achieving individual learning outcomes, where are they failing, and what do you need to do differently in your classroom to try to serve those students? All of this leads into the problem of data collection, right? In order to drive these systems, what we need are common mechanisms for data collection, and this has been... Um, made really apparent to me recently in participation with uh, an NGLC grant, uh, David Wiley and I were actually just having a conversation about this, that when you end up having lots and lots of different kinds of data at varying degrees of richness being collected, it's almost impossible to apply a standard set of tools and to give information back to the faculty that are, uh, that are actionable. So one of the first steps in getting to the ability to build a standard set of tools and platforms is starting to get at data collection. These, however, are technical problems. And the technical problems aren't the hard ones to solve. It's the second three. Um, and these are the issues that are actually, you know, if we can solve these, taking care of the technical problem of data collection is easy. So where do we want to go with this? What would the ideal situation look like? Well, we have some common data standards, some comparable metrics that we can all take advantage of. Uh, we have analytics enabled OER. We make these, these platforms and systems uh, just available as you're creating things. You're, it's there, you have the power of data collection and analytics. Uh, we developed some commonly accepted ownership and privacy approaches, and we all have a community-based commitment to measuring effectiveness through assessment. 
So how do we how do we approach this? Well, let's let's start um, by bringing together what already works. What already works on data collection. What already works on gathering evidence and what works for analysis tools. And there's already a lot of great stuff out there. And that's, again, that's been what an awful lot of this conference has been about, at least from my perspective, is finding out just how much stuff is out there that either isn't well publicized or that we just haven't been talking to. Um, yeah, we can we run through these real quick. So you know, within the OLI, we have our, our learning dashboard. It's uh, for instructors. It gives a, a learning outcome-centered view of student, um, student performance. We work with the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center. They have a large data repository called Data Shop, which is designed for learning scientists and educational data miners. Um, the All That Evidence Hub is a great place to co to, that's collecting uh, evidence about what makes OER effective, what makes use of OER effective. Uh, we have projects like Learning Registry, which are trying to tackle this, these data collection and distribution problems, We're looking at forming schemas for, we talk for allowing us to talk about data in common ways. Um, and there's also some work that uh, we're doing in our project about communities of evidence. And yeah, so this is what the current CCOLI project has really been about. It's been about uh, explicitly building courses that are going to address the gatekeeper problem, but doing so in a way that's not building a single OER, OER that's intended to solve all problems, but instead creating a community that's going to both help develop, evaluate, and improve that OER, and use it, so that once you have something that works, you're able to improve it in specific directions um, in some of the more individual contexts that you need. Um, and so, so we have some existing things, uh, but we also need to build new things in each of the same areas. Um, and so a lot of this work is driven by different types of data. So we need to define what these different types of data are. We have metadata, paradata, contextual data, the context of the use, um, behaviors, since behaviors, logging into a system, viewing a page, watching a video, interaction level data, did I respond correct or incorrect? What are the, what, for, for, what are the practice opportunities that are available to the students? What are the skills that go with them? Uh, what sort of support they, are they receiving from an, an automated tutor system? And then there's just even raw data that provides this opportunity for finer grain uh, educational research to benefit the science of learning, things like mouse clicks and individual interactions in the system. <coughs> um, and we think that one of the other things that we need to build are better mechanisms for making sure that the data is shared. Right now, all of the data that's out there ends up being wrapped up in individual LMSs. When we are lucky, we can get some common agreement on, okay, you know, I'm participating in this grant, and part of this means that I'm going to feed back the data to you. But what we'd like to see is a world where taking advantage of, the, of an OER means uh, explicitly agreeing to share the data. So yeah, we've got this mock-up of the Creative Commons license here. I thought Cable was going to be in here. We're going to harass him about but uh, <laughs> lost my opportunity for that. This sense that if I'm contributing a piece of, uh, if I'm contributing a resource into the Commons, one of the things that I expect to get back from that contribution is that folks using that are going to put the data back into the world so that we can take advantage of it and continue to, uh, to improve the resource. Absent these kinds of mechanisms and policies, the data will continue to hide on individual <coughs> servers. And really the only way to make this happen is through a community-based approach. And this is the way the OLI project approaches purchase course development. Um, when we set up to build a course, we're actually bringing together different areas of expertise and these interdisciplinary teams that draw on the expertise of Carnegie Mellon, but also uh, inter other institutions that we work with. Question. Uh, on the previous slide, what was the SD? Was the oh, shared data. Oh, shared data. Shared data. So we were proposing a new license type that would be <laughs> share alike, but also <laughs> share data. <laughs> Uh, those, you know, this is the top of the slide. We actually argued a bit about whether it should be uh, whether it should be share data or evaluate alike. Actually, but that's something that we can get into conversation. And so, um, you know, the real benefit of this community-based approach is we feel this this allows us to build alignment in ways that help to break that reusability paradox because we can bring different perspectives on a domain together, find that common core of things. Uh, build alignment around a common set of student outcomes. And yeah, we have to adapt for business statistics. We need to add some different examples there. Sure, we need to make sure the context um, is right, but um, we can actually, if we can build pedagogical alignment in a community, then we create greater opportunities to reuse, and that, that, that paradox starts to break down. And from our perspective, that's one of the only ways that we're actually able to build better tools. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so in this way, this is one of the ways to break this concern between the infinite variety of courses and folks that are concerned that we're trying to build the one single course, that as communities coalesce around a resource, it starts to be improved and developed in, uh, in specific contexts. Uh, so we bring those together to have a full spectrum, and by this we mean that full stack of data, so we can really capture a complete picture about uh, what's happening in, in, the system, in the students' use of data, using that to inform improvement. Um, and trying to look up, take a comprehensive approach to our, our view on things. 
Um, what this eventually gets us is, you know, even the current analytics tools that we're talking about that we've shown you end up being the tip of the iceberg. We end up being able to build incredibly effective learning intelligence systems that are not just going to improve the OER, but are in the end going to improve student experience. And, and there is a consequence here that's worth acknowledging, um, which is that we are giving something up in this approach, and that is, um, you know, we have to open our, our minds or allow it to be changed by evidence. You know, it's, we have to take a scientific view to construction and then, uh, to constructing these resources. And when things don't work, we have to try to say, okay, you know, we might have to uh, improve things, abandon things, change things, modify things to really find. Uh, what does work and what are the relevant contextual variables that make that scalable. So next steps. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of outlined a, little, a general approach here. Uh, we, we talked about standards a lot uh, yesterday to the problems in that space and we kind of feel that like innovation has to come first. So we want to talk about innovate, innovating, standardizing, and scaling the stop signal. So we'll, we'll kind of jump to our conclusions. Uh, which is this, the ways to hit this are, uh, you know, not just a shared community commitment to assessment and evaluation, but building this definition of analytics enabled OER so that as we continue to create and improve AR, we can, OER, we can do it towards this definition, a common approach to data, and then building these shared and private analytics platforms. It's recognizing that some of these platforms are going to need to exist in the commons, but this doesn't need to preclude folks from building their own platforms, which are going to exist whether commercially or inside individual institutions. It's speaking the same language. And these platforms need to be the enabling infrastructure that allows technology to get out of the way of uh, folks building these resources so you can build whatever your OER is and not have to think too hard about all the technology, all the data formats, all the interoperability concerns that go with uh, an analytics-based approach. I think we've got about three minutes for questions. So we've completely destroyed our intent to have a good discussion by talking too much over our slides, but uh, the questions or comments? Do you have any uh, existing um, evidence analytical models uh, that you're that's in use right now that's not uh, using OLI uh, that are using plan to make available for public consumption? So I think the things that we're currently using most extensively are the uh, learning dashboard tool that we show, which is intended for instructors. We're now building that out to uh, make it a tool to be better used for course developers. And the tools that are available from uh, PSLC's data shop, which are publicly available, and further, which we've taken some of our data and already made publicly available, we plug into. So both the tool and the data has been made available, uh, mostly from our stats course, but we're looking at other courses. Are you using data, data mining for, for any of your analytical um, evaluation? Yeah, uh, we, we actually, we, we are. Um, yeah, we have models associated with that. <coughs> we do, we, we, we actually have a competition going of uh, some of the models. So we have a researcher who created a, uh, a knowledge construction module for uh, statistics. We actually, have, uh, we actually engaged in the community of data miners, uh, learning, learning science data mining community through the Venture Science and Learning Center. We actually have competing resources to try to find better models. So uh, this is something that we're it's actually a, the attempt is to beat the researcher. Can you build an automated model that will do better than the researcher so can is all do? That information sure, yeah. Let's yeah, talk more offline. So I, I think we're getting the wrap up signal, but I know uh, I think Josh had a comment. So what's the um, what's the uh, process and the earliest date to get a prototype or a reference implementation of this sort of shared platform idea that could federate experiences from lots of different sources and, and places on top of these kind of tools? So it's something we're, we're moving um, aggressively on now. Um, I've been talking with some of the learning registry folks here and other, other folks here about what opportunities um, we, they're bringing uh, systems together. And what we want to do is uh, we're working with uh, the uh, tax grantees and the Department of Labor uh, and the consortium, uh, the open consortium around providing services to these folks. We want to make sure that, that platform uh, evolves to providing some of these uh, basic analytic functions so that folks uh, who are building those resources can uh, bootstrap their way into these cycles of continuous effectiveness. So months, not years, I think yeah. is the short answer. And, and so that's actually a call to everyone here is to come talk to us, uh, give us your thoughts on this approach, and uh, let's figure out how we can work together to do the uh, to innovate and then standardize the scale we're working on. Thanks, sorry to have uh, <laughs>